Uh, hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. My name is Kambiz Ranavardi, co-president of Columbia DC and graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. This year is the 150th anniversary of German unification, uh, happened in uh, 18, 1871. And to commemorate that, we, we are uh, very honored and privileged to have Adam Toos, Catherine and Shelby Colin Davis, Professor of History and Director of the European Institute at Columbia University to discuss Bismarck, Realpolitik and birth of the German nation with us. Um, Adam is actually uh, in London, uh, and uh, even so, uh, he, he was gracious enough to uh, to uh, be here with us and talk to us at uh, such uh, a late hour for him. So we are uh, eternally grateful. Uh, please allow me to introduce Adam before we can start. Adam Toos was born in London, uh, but he grew up between England and Heidelberg, Germany. Having received his uh, BA in economics from King's College, Cambridge in the summer of 1989, he had the good fortune to witness the end of the Cold War in Berlin, where he began his postgraduate studies. He went on to take his PhD from the London School of Economics. From 1996 to 2009, Adam taught at the University of Cambridge, where he was reader in modern history and Gurney Hart fellow in history at Jesus College. After Cambridge, Adam was appointed to the Baron M. Biggs professorship at Yale University, where he succeeded Paul Kennedy as the director of international security studies. Adam joined Columbia's history department in the summer of 2015. Without further ado, uh, Adam, it's all yours. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Thanks to the magic of Zoom, I'm, um, I am indeed speaking to you from from London. Um, I'm going to uh, share some slides and uh, please interrupt me if, if there's any kind of technical issue. Well, welcome everyone. Um, let's go back to the beginning. So this is the, this is the extraordinary uh, image of the moment um, on the 18th of January, 1871, in which the German empire was proclaimed um, in the halls, the Hall of Mirrors, unmistakably, uh, of Versailles, uh, a great monument. If you've been to Versailles, you'll know a great monument. Louis XIV's repeating battering of Germany in his campaigns in, in Germany in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, chosen, not coincidentally, by the Germans, assembled here as a sort of crowd of Germanic tribal leaders in the great palace of French monarchy. Um, and the three men that will that will center uh, the be at the center of today's story are positioned strategically at the center here uh wilhelm the first of prussia who is rather reluctantly being declared emperor here um molke helmut von molke the commander-in-chief of the german armed forces that had just won an extraordinary victory in france and then strategically positioned at the center of the image uh, also from bismarck um, the man whose strategy whose statesmanship will be the mastermind, if you like, behind the creation of the German nation. And what they are bringing about was indeed a, a truly radical transformation of the map of Europe and the map of Central Europe and of Germany in particular. And this is the, the map of the world as it emerged from the shock of the Napoleonic era in 1815. Uh, you can see uh, the, the fundamental defining feature of this map is the fragmentation of the German states at the centre of Hubert, uh, Europe here, the soft centre, the soft centre of, of Europe. Uh, this is this is the map after the the 18th of January uh, 1871. Um, the result, um, in the words of, of British politician and Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli in the House of Commons only a few weeks later in 1871 was a, a German revolution, a greater political event than the French revolution. He claimed there's not a single diplomatic tradition that has not been swept away in the process of the creation of this German nation state. And, and you, you could say in a, in a way that he was prophetic um, from 1871 onwards, arguably all the way down to 1990, um, the diplomatic history of much of the world and certainly of Europe was dominated by the question of how the rest of Europe would come to terms with this extraordinarily transformed map, the dominance of Germany, which would lead, of course, to the great conflicts of 1914 and 1939, the separation of Germany in the period 
after 1945 into two separate parts. And then they're fusing back together again in 1990 to create the map of Europe that we're familiar with today. So 1871 really does go down in history, I think, as a, as a seminal moment for the history of, of the European continent. And there's a sense in which you could think, and it's not unreasonable to say, that there was a degree of inevitability about this, to ask how it happens, maybe to pose the wrong question. Nationalism was very much the spirit of the age. Germany was by no means the first country to be unified amongst the large partition parts of Europe. Italy was in 18, 1859, and I'll have more to say about that in a second. Conservative modernizers of the ilk of Camille Cabour or Otto von Bismarck had coined the idea that for everything to stay the same, everything had to change. So the ideological barriers, if you like, to radical change in Europe had, had begun to fall. And then you might think, after all, that Prussia had a formidable track record of state building going all the way back to the great electors of the 17th century. So in a sense, the fact that Germany was unified around Prussia should not really come as any great surprise to us. But um, the purpose of my lecture this evening is actually to destabilize this self-confidence and, and to, to, to really put in question the, the, the inevitability of this process, or rather to use the question of how it came about to expose quite how contingent, how difficult it was to assemble this state, which after all did then prove to be very unstable, did not in fact endure beyond 1949, and has been reassembled in the sense that it has been reassembled under radically different conditions. So this thing that took place in January 1871, I would suggest was in fact rather fragile, dynamic, unstable, explosive indeed, and not in the end very long lasting. It was in fact anything other than obvious, if you just look at the map of Europe after the Napoleonic War, the great traumatic event that ended the 18th century and began the modern era really at the beginning of the 19th century, if you look at this map of Germany at the heart of Europe here and ask yourself the question how on earth you might overcome this patchwork division of Germany, Various options suggest them themselves. So it's, it, isn't, it isn't that there isn't a lack of ideas about how you might unify Germany. It's just that every single one of them poses very considerable risks and has very obvious objections. So if we look in turn at the three great options that were widely discussed as future models for how Germany might be organized, you can very easily see how on the one hand each one of them would have adherence and on the other hand how each one of them might also seem completely impossible of realization. So the most obvious one and the one which ultimately emerges as the pattern of German unification as we know it is the so-called little German or Kleindeutsch solution. It excludes the Habsburg Empire, the bit down here, the bit that extends all the way over here on this map, it excludes, therefore, many people who were ethnically and culturally German, amongst them the young Adolf Hitler. Um, it begs the question of whether Prussia, which, if you look at this map here, will evidently be the dominant power within this smaller Germany, will in fact be the dominant power, or whether it will be submerged. One of the reasons why King Wilhelm on the throne in Versailles in January 1871 was as reluctant as he was, it was that he feared that latter option, that by merging Prussia into a little German solution, Prussia would lose its distinctiveness. Well, so do you might opt for an alternative option. So how about the Großdeutsch solution, the greater German solution, consisting of all of the territories in Central Europe containing Germans? Well, this would satisfy German nationalism, one of its implications would be that you'd end up having to partition the Habsburg Empire, which was multinational, included very many ethnic and cultural groups which were not, nation, not German, most notably Poles, South Slavs, Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks. It would fundamentally pose the question of what you were going to do with the Czech the Slovaks, who were the most powerful group within the Habsburg Empire other than the Hungarians, and furthermore building an entity as large as this, it was also likely to provoke the opposition of all of Germany's, this new Germany, this new greater Germany's neighbours. And if you went for the even more comprehensive option, which you might call a greater Austria, merging the entire Habsburg Empire within the German Federation to create a giant state, well, it would be massively multi-ethnic. It would be one dominated by the Habsburgs. And if the great German solution was going to antagonize every one of Germany's neighbors, well, this would antagonize absolutely everyone. It would be a matter of 
urgency for everyone else in Europe to ally themselves to counterbalance the force of this new German entity. The result is that when German unification was achieved in 1871, it was the result not just of one war, but of three wars fought in short succession between 1864, first against the Danes, then in, against Austria in 1866, what I'm going to call the German Civil War, and then the war against France in 1870-71. And the astonishing fact is that Prussia was willing to take that risk of fighting three wars, and in fact even more astonishing is the fact that it won them. Because Prussia is not the titan that it's often made out to be. In fact, amongst the large established powers of Europe, which were disrupted by the formation of Germany in 1871, Prussia was still very much the less, the least of the European powers. If you go back to the map of the 18th century, this is astonishingly evident. So here we have France, the great France created by Louis XIV in particular. You have Great Britain, of course, with its global empire. Then you have the Habsburg Empire here, dominating Central Europe. Then you have Poland, Lithuania, which gets swallowed up by a partition organized between the Habsburg Empire and the great power to the east, Russia, the Tsarist Empire, and Brandenburg, Prussia, as very much the smaller and third partner. Prussia is barely counted amongst the great powers of Europe in the 18th century. Its status is very unclear. It's not at all obvious that Saxony isn't going to appear as the major power because Saxony is allied with Poland in this period. So Prussia's emergence over the course of the 19th century as the potential unifier of Germany is anything other than, anything other than self-evident. Now, of course, there is the figure of Frederick the Great, who is the great Prussian hero of the 18th century, but he rather clouds our perspective because in retrospect, we think of him as the, the first German warlord. But in fact, in many respects, he was most notable for the fact that he survived at all. This sort of image of Frederick the Great gives you a rather clearer idea of, as it were, he was a battle-hardened leader leading the tattered battle flags of Prussia in one last gasp attempt to overwhelm massively superior uh, enemies. In the Seven Years' War, Prussia found itself encircled by a coalition that consisted of France, Austria and Russia. And not surprisingly, by 1861, after the fall of its last port on the Baltic coast at Kohlberg in 1761, Prussia's situation looked completely hopeless. It looked as though Prussia was going to be erased from the map. So just more than a century before that moment at Versailles in 1871, the prospect of Prussian generals being in Paris was would have considered struck most people as insane. This is a sort of Valley Forge moment of uh, Prussian history. Prussia is saved from what appeared to be ultimate destruction by what's known at the time as the miracle of the House of Brandenburg, because the pivot and this is a theme I'm going to return to several times in today's talk, the pivot of Prussia's fate was Russia. And the pivot of the alliance against Frederick the Great was Tsarina Elizabeth. And quite suddenly on the 5th of January, 1762, she dies. And with her death, the coalition that appeared to seal Prussia's fate collapses. It disintegrates and Frederick the Great is able to save a status quo peace from the jaws of total defeat in 1763. The point here is simply that the trajectory of Prussia's rise is anything other than obvious. And if they survive by the skin of their teeth in the Seven Years' War that ended in 1763, they're not so lucky half a century later. Uh, Frederick the Great's successors, much lesser men than Frederick, are much less lucky because they come up against the great destructive wrecking ball of European history, the force that just piled through European history at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. And I'm, I'm talking, of course, about uh, the Corsican upscore Napoleon Bonaparte. And in the fall of 1806, Napoleon accomplishes what the alliance against Frederick the Great had not been able to accomplish, which is effectively the erasure of the Prussian state. It is barely too much to say that in the fall of 1806, Prussia ceases to exist as a major political and military force. This is Napoleon taking occupation of uh, Berlin, as you can see, this is the Brandenburg Gate with the Quadriga on top on the 27th of October, 1806. The quadriga, the, the ceremonial topping of the Brandenburg Gate, is dismantled and schlepped off to Paris, like so much other uh, artwork 
uh, not returned to uh, Prussia until 1814, when the defeat of Napoleon, the first defeat of Napoleon. But at this moment, it looks as though this upstart state, which came out of nowhere in the 17th century and somehow through the skin of Frederick the Great's teeth managed to survive the 18th century, had really ceased to play a part in European history. This is the map of Europe in 1808. And you'll be hard pressed to find Prussia on it. It's the bit that's left in between here. This is German, French controlled Germany, remodeled by uh, Napoleon with his, his generals and his relations installed as the kings and dukes um, that rule the new German states. And this is the reconstituted Polish state, of which Napoleon is the great sponsor. And that leaves this as Prussia. It's about a half its pre war size. It's uh, uh, laboring under massive reparations. And the sign of its ultimate subordination comes in 1812 when Napoleon orders not just the French army, but the armies of all of the allied German states and Prussia and, of course, Poland to embark on his great military adventure, which is the invasion of Russia. When we say France invaded Russia in 1812, this is actually a misstatement. France and Germany under French command invaded Russia in 1812. And it's that turn of events, uh, Napoleon's ultimate act of hubris, which in fact reopens the door. And now we're only talking 50 years before that moment in Paris in 1871, reopens that door, 60 years, reopens the door to the re-emergence of Prussia. Uh, because it's Napoleon's defeat in Russia in 1812, the collapse apps of the Russia of the French army and its desperate retreat out of out of, uh, of Russia that opens the door to what is the first anticipation of that moment in Versailles in 1871, the German national uprising of 1813. Now one shouldn't exaggerate the extent of this. It's very very much romanticized by later German nationalists. But there's no doubt that at this moment something changed, which is that Germany experienced a levée en masse, a collective uprising. This image is highly significant. These are young men proudly marching out of what is obviously a Lutheran church here. These are the women folk celebrating the arising of German nationalism against the French. You see already the colors, black, yellow, gold, red. And here on the right hand side, you see a Jewish family here. A, a, a obviously a, a Jewish man in the old garb of, of traditional Jewish minorities in Germany, sending his Jewish son off to fight with the rest of Germany in the war of national liberation against Napoleon. This, the manifesto issued rather reluctantly by the Prussian uh, dynasty on the 20th of March, 1813. And it begins with the telling words, am mein Volk to my people. And it is a flaming, we could spend more time talking about this in Q&A afterwards, I don't have time now to dissect the whole text, but it's an appeal by the Prussian monarchy on behalf of the German nation to rise up against the French, um, to emulate in fact the bravery of the Spanish who had launched the famous guerrilla resistance to the French in 1808. The point to be made here is simply that 60 years before that moment of what seemed like inevitable Prussian triumph in Versailles, what we're seeing here is the desperate uprising of an oppressed people against overweening French power, reluctantly headed up by a, Fr a Prussian dynasty which is whose fate, not for the first time, is hanging, is hanging by a thread. And it's a story with an ironic twist. And this is the first of two great betrayals of German nationalism that lead up to that third moment in 1871, which is the post-Napoleonic negotiations. Because as willing as the Prussian dynasty is in 1813 to call on popular enthusiasm, and by popular, we're meaning the educated population of Prussia, the, the students, the educated students, the Jane Austen reading classes of the period, women as well as men, uh, appealing to their patriotism as determined is that dynasty to squash that nationalist ambition at the end of the war. So as much as they want to drive Napoleon out, their interest is actually not to restore or to build a German nation state at that moment, but to reconsolidate the map that we began the, today's lecture with. And 
In that act of restoration that ends the Napoleonic period, Prussia is a player. This is uh, uh, the Frederick Wilhelm III, the rather elegant young man on the right hand side here. But his senior partners in that restabilization are not Prussia. His senior partners in the restabilization are Francis I of Austria and the all powerful Russians, Alexander I of Russia, because it is the Russians that turned the tide and defeated Napoleon. And it is therefore their conservative forces that shape uh, the aftermath uh, uh, of the Napoleonic era, also in Central Europe. The dominant power in Europe is Russia on the mainland, offshore, of course, it's Great Britain. But on the mainland, it's Russia, the dominant power in Germany at that moment, 50 years before our, you know, our triumph of Prussian power in Versailles is Austria. And the leading figure of the Austrian effort to stabilize post-Napoleonic Central Europe is, of course, Clement Wenzel, uh, Lothar Fürst von Metternich, uh, the extraordinary conservative statesman genius of the repressive uh, period after 1815. And Metternich's central idea, thinking about those three options and the fact that none of them look good, a small Germany dominated by Prussia, clearly can't be good for Austria. A purely German, large Germany would be terrible for Austria because it would involve tearing the Habsburg Empire apart. And a Germany entirely dominated by the Habsburg Empire would be good for Vienna, but it would immediately raise against you every enemy in Europe. So none of those options look any good to Metternich. And for that reason, what his main job is, is to repress the German nationalism of the early 1800s. And it's essentially a losing game. He succeeds for a while, over a period of decades, he runs one of the most sophisticated secret services in Europe at the time. But the Germans are a reading people. It's a highly literate population by the early 1800s. And it is very difficult to repress a population that's able to read and to fundamentally change its mind. And over a period of decades, at festivals like the Hambach Festival here of the early 1830s, the irresistible pressure of German nationalism makes itself manifest. Now, that doesn't mean that these folks here have a good answer to any of the questions either as to how to make a German nation state. On the other hand, they're not going away either. And they have pressing, urgent problems that they need to address because the early 19th century is when the Industrial Revolution begins in earnest. On to the north of Germany, across the North Sea, the Germans watch with awe as the Industrial Revolution takes off in Britain. The 1830s is really the moment with the advent of the steam engine that steam power really becomes uh, ubiquitous in the advanced economies of the world. And the question for the Germans is, are we going to miss the bus? Are we going to be left behind as Britain, Belgium uh, mobilize the new resources of the fossil fuel revolution? And so this too is a fundamental destabilizing force for anyone attempting to stabilize the existing existing status quo in Europe in this period. And Prussia has an answer to its credit. It has an answer, and its answer takes the form of the famous customs union, the Zollverein, which will forever after stand as an example of the way in which economic power can be translated ultimately into political power. What Prussia begins to do is to gather around itself, as you can see here, a strip of German states, uh, crucially in the center, and then also Bavaria, Austria's traditional ally, joins the customs Union uh, by the 1830s. Now, this is a step in the right direction. It's also a step clearly towards a small Germany rather than a big Germany. So this begins to prejudice the way in which the game is going to be played. But A, it runs up against Austrian opposition. B, it's very incomplete. Note the absence of Hanover up here. Traditionally, historically, of course, allied with Britain, resisting the hegemony of Prussia. And thirdly, this zone much as it forms a coherent customs unit, lacks infrastructure. And above all, it lacks railways. And the problem with railways is you need a lot of capital and you need to be able to borrow. And you can only borrow if you can raise revenue and a state to raise revenue needs to have taxation. And the problem with taxation, as you know from the American case, is that you can't have taxation without representation. And so the question of how to actually flesh this out becomes not just geopolitical, will it be Prussia versus Austria, but it becomes eminently political because the question is, do we need a parliament? And the answer is the Germans, the Prussians have to call a parliament. They call a parliament in 1847. And that means that Prussia is embarking on the project of parliamentarization precisely as the great revolutionary wave of 1848 sweeps across Europe. And so incongruously, 
Berlin becomes the capital of the Prussian kings, the capital of Frederick the Great, becomes the center of a massive revolutionary upheaval in the spring of 1848. So again, now this, we're only talking 20 years away now from that moment, monarchical in the extreme, you know, the image of aristocratic Prussia um, making and monarchical Prussia making a reunified German, a unified Germany. Here in 1848, 20 years before, barely, barely, uh, just over 20 years before, we have a project of German national unification. You can see the flag being proudly waved here. This incidentally, these are the colours incidentally, of one of the Freikorps, one of the volunteer regiments that fought against Napoleon, proudly being waved, not in a French palace by uh, Prussian uh, aristocrats and soldiers, but by a revolutionary mob on a barricade in the middle of the Prussian capital. And a parliament meets in Frankfurt. Uh, the first German parliament meets in Frankfurt in the so-called, in the, in the famous Paulskirche, as you can see again, decorated a unifying rhetoric, a unifying language, a symbolism of German nationalism is emerging here. And they draft a constitution. The Frankfurt parliament has a terrible reputation. It's often dismissed by conservatives as nothing more than a talking shop. It in fact drafts the first German constitution, which is highly influential in the constitution drafted a hundred years later, when West Germany gets its start in life in 1949. They take entire passage from this 1849 constitution. The question, however, for the folks in Frankfurt is who's going to be the king? Who's going to be the sovereign authority that binds this Germany together? And for them, really, after trying various options out and they play out the large German, the mega Austria, it's pretty obvious that the only way in which they can really go is Prussia. So remarkably, in on the 3rd of April, 1849, the German parliamentarians offer the crown of the new emperor of Germany to Frederick Wilhelm IV of Prussia. So this is the moment surely in which Germany gets unified under Prussian rule and it's at the hands of parliamentarians. And this is what happened, isn't it? Except we know it isn't what happened because astonishingly, the Prussian king turns them down. So, so <laughs> this moment in 1871 is really, you can see like it's sort of it's extraordinary inversion of all other options. In 1870, in 1849, the Prussian king doesn't want to be emperor of all the Germans, in part because he's being offered the crown by parliamentarians. He calls it a pig's crown. Why would I, a proud monarch, take a crown from a bunch of revolutionaries like you? Uh, no, thank you very much. No, I, you know, I'm not going to do it. If, however, he considered seizing the crown through conflict with Austria, that would be a different type of risk. And when the Prussians edge towards doing that in 1850, something even more menacing rears itself on the horizon, which is the real power in Europe shows itself and it's Russia. And in a remarkable turn of events, on November 29, 1850, the Russians force the Prussians to accept their diktat that Prussia will renounce any claim to leadership of the German universe, of the German Union on the pain, if they were to violate this Russian diktat, of immediate military sanctions by Russia, which will be completely overwhelming for Prussia at this point. So to reiterate my now constant is refrain, this is 21 years before that same state Prussia in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles claims for itself leadership of a unified Germany. So something very dramatic has happened. But in the aftermath of this, the entire idea of German unity has become a joke, as it says here in this cartoon, the Trauerspiel, so a sort of grim joke, a dark, humorous plot. In the aftermath of 1848-1850 amongst liberal Germans, the idea of German unification seemed basically a busted flush. Uh, the idea that Prussia could unify seemed really absurd. The Prussians had been offered it and then had attempted to take it and the first time round they'd said no and the second time round they'd been too afraid of the Russians and the only good use for German soldiers in the wake of 1848-1849 seemed to be to shoot their own people and it's in this aftermath of this disillusionment that radical Germans leave Germany and they emigrate to the United States and they become the radical wing of the American politics in the 1850s and 60s, uh, many of them become key abolitionist figures and combatants in the American Civil War on the Union side. 
The Times of London in 1860 commented like this, Prussia was always leaning on somebody, always getting somebody to help her, never willing to help herself, present in congresses, but absent in battles. Remember, Olmutz wasn't willing to take the risk of fighting Austria and, and Russia, ready to supply any amount of ideals or sentiments. Prussia was good for philosophy and the University of Berlin was a big deal, but shy of anything that savors of the actual, actual, uh, you know, this is a play on words on Hegel's philosophy. She has a large army, but notoriously one in no condition for fighting. This is the judgment of the leading newspaper of the day on Prussia in 1860. No one counts on her as a friend. No one dreads her as an enemy. How she became a great power, history tells us. We all remember about Frederick the Great. Why she remains, no one can tell. Right. So this is the judgment of contemporary opinion on Prussia at a moment at which things were really kicking off. We often have an image of the 19th century as being one of peace, but in fact, the period between the 1850s and the 1870s is one of really dramatic violence. We have in China, the Taiping Rebellion, the Opium Wars, the Crimean Wars, I'll come back to in a second, the Indian Wars in the United States, the Indian Mutiny or the Great Rebellion in India, the First Wars of Italian Unification, the American Civil War, the French intervention in Mexico, the Japanese Civil War that leads to the Meiji Restoration. This is not a period in which it is safe to be how the Times is describing Prussia. And it's out of that sense of crisis, this is the counterintuitive argument I want to make to you, out of the sense of being in a complete impasse indeed, in the wake of the events of the first half of the 19th century, that Prussia suddenly catapults itself into being an active force, a very powerful military force, the opposite of how the News Times newspaper describes it here. And this is where the role of people like Bismarck comes to the fore. And the shock that triggers this is, an, is another act of national unification. It's not German national unification, it's Italian unification through war, through a war launched by the Piedmontese, um, the powerful North Italian state in alliance with the French against Austria in 1859, which results in the unification of much of Italy. Now, this teaches all of Europe two lessons, which are very important. The first is that the French are still the wild card. This isn't Napoleon I himself. He's, of course, died in exile. But it's his nephew, the self-made emperor Napoleon III, who is the main disruptive force in European politics at the time. He's stirring things up. And secondly, and this is the really eye-opening thing for people in Germany, is Austria which in 1848, 1850 had apparently enjoyed the protection of Russia, such that if Prussia nibbled away at Austrian power, Russia would impose a humiliating diktat, is all of a sudden fair game. France with Sardinia has launched an attack on Austria's possessions in Italy, seized control of Italy and reunified Italy, and no one has intervened. So what has happened? And the answer lies in a relatively obscure war for many people that happened a few years earlier in the Crimea in 1854. Because there again, Napoleon III, in alliance with the British and the Ottoman Empire, had fought a war for control of the Crimean Peninsula against the Tsarist Empire, the great expansive empire of continental Europe in the 19th century, expanding even more rapidly than the United States or any other colonial power. And resisting Russian expansion was pivotal, was key to global politics. Now, Prussia, as the New Times newspaper had commented, had stood aside. No one wanted it to be its ally, no one needed Prussia to be its ally, and Prussia didn't frankly feel like testing the waters. But Austria was foolish enough to actually take advantage of this situation, to exploit Russia's embarrassment, and to try and seize control of the lower Danube region, what is now Romania. And this, crucially, unpicks the alliance between Austria and Russia. And what that does is to totally destabilize the Napoleonic order created really after 1808, 1809 to contain Napoleon and to force him back and ultimately to prevail against Napoleon. Not the British, not the Prussians. It's really the Austro-Russian alliance that does that. And in 1854, that alliance comes apart. And it's that which creates the possibility for the entire map of Europe to be rearranged. Napoleon III immediately seizes, seizes this opportunity and says, right, I can now establish France as a hegemon in Italy by sponsoring Italian unification. In Prussia, there's a young man who recognizes the situation as well. And that young man is Otto von Bismarck. And this is how he enters this picture. 
because Otto von Bismarck is the diplomat within Prussia who most quickly sizes up this new situation created by the separation between Austria and Russia and explains and desperately impresses on the Prussian monarchy and its advisors the seriousness of the situation. This is on the one hand a huge opportunity to shift the balance of power against Austria without Russia intervening. It is, however, on the other hand, also a huge risk. We will be the anvil if we do not make ourselves into the hammer, is his lesson. So you are either the victim or the perpetrator in history. You've got no choice. Standing aside is no longer an option. Why? Because the fundamental risk for Prussia is that what could happen is that Russia and France if Russia is detracted from Austria, what Russia could do is find itself allied with France. And if that were to happen, it would be the nightmare situation that almost destroyed Frederick the Great in the Seven Years' War in 1761. This is how long the memory of diplomacy is. And this is what immediately Bismarck, of course, sees moving up in front of him. It will, of course, also be the alliance that faces Germany in 1914. And he sees this emerging as soon as Austria becomes detached from Russia. This is the next combination that will emerge. And so Prussia at that point really has only one option, which is to go forward, even at the expense of blowing up the entire existing order. Who's Bismarck? Well, Otto von Bismarck is an extraordinary career and it's a man whose biography is well worth exploring. There are many great biographies. The most recent is uh, by my old friend, Jonathan Steinberg. He was a hell-raising conservative frat brother, womanizer in his youth, uh, drunk basically, um, saved from dissolution by his marriage to this remarkable woman, Johanna von Puttkammer, who he uh, got to know and very quickly married in 1845. She was a pietist, a devout evangelical. And she gave the young Bismarck a new purpose in life. And he enters the Prussian parliament of 1847 as one of the conservative firebrands, is noticed by the Prussian king, who really respects and appreciates his defense of the monarchy in a revolutionary era, and is dispatched, non-coincidentally, as ambassador to Russia in 1858. And then another key set of events uh, is set in Ocean, which opens the door to Bismarck to rise rapidly to the top of Prussian politics. Um, in 1857, um, uh, a, a Prussian prince assumes power who turns out to have cancer and he dies rather quickly, um, opening the door to the regency of William Frederick Louis of Prussia, who becomes Prince Regent in 1858 and then King of Prussia in 1861. And he is the bona fide. Prussian military tradition personified, which means that he's a victim who's been beaten up on by the French ever since he was a kid. He joined the army in 1797. He experienced the defeat at the hands of Napoleon as a teenager. His entire project in life is to resurrect the power of the Prussian state as he understands it and to reconnect to the history of Frederick the Great. It's a fragile, difficult thing that has to be resurrected. And he has, he in 1848, in 49, was a reactionary of the staunchest type, totally opposed to German nationalism, the parliament, any principles of liberalism. He was known as the grape shot prince for his, the enthusiasm with which he shot down revolutionaries, his own people. Um, in the revolutionary combats of 1848 and 49. He actually had to spend quite a lot of time in exile. He was that unpopular. This is the man who will be in that picture in 1871, as unlikely a prophet of German nationalism as you could possibly imagine. He has around him in his core project, which is rebuilding German military power, deeply reactionary. You can tell by their haircuts. Uh, and their outfits, neo-medieval exponents of reactionary politics in the 1850s and 1860s. Albrecht von Roon, a full technocratic Prussian military officer bent on trying to modernize the Prussian military so it's no longer useless and capable of actually fighting. And Edwin von Manteuffel, who's the political brains behind the operation and really is looking for an opportunity to roll back liberalism altogether. He likes to challenge li liberal parliamentarians to duels in the hope of shooting them dead. Um, and the problem for them, however, is they're incredibly unpopular. And in the wake of the 1848 revolution, Prussia actually had a parliament. The tradition of voting in Germany goes back a very long way. German democracy is not a new thing created in, I don't know, after 1945. It goes all the way back to the 19th century. 
And in the middle of the 19th century, Prussia had parliamentary elections and they were repeatedly won by liberals. In fact, left liberals or other liberals, you can see the majority is 350. And in the elections of the early 1860s, which is the moment that we're talking about, you can see the liberals have about two thirds of the votes in the Prussian parliament. The idea of the conservatives is, if only we can fight a war that would be popular with the nationalists, we could then perhaps tilt the balance in the parliament by proving ourselves to be actual exponents of Prussian power and to seize the initiative that was lost so humiliate, humiliatingly in 1848-49-50. But their problem is that to be able to fight a war, you need an army. An army costs money. And the people who control the purse strings, no taxation without representation, are the parliamentarians, and they're liberal. And they won't vote money for people like these two. And this is where Bismarck enters the story, because in 1862, Bismarck is brought back from Petersburg to be the conservative answer to the parliamentary question. Maybe this guy who's come up through the parliamentary system ever since 1847 can find some way out. And this is how contemporary cartoonists describe the state of Prussian politics in 1863. This now is only, what, eight years before that moment of triumph in 1871. Here's... Uh, Wilhelm I, here's Bismarck playing the tune, here's the parliament, here's the press. This is a tumultuous situation in which the king repeatedly considers abdicating, Manteuffel repeatedly considers having a coup. Prussia could have gone a Latin American direction at this moment. And it, the genius of Bismarck is, and this is what I'm going to be talking about in the last 10 minutes or so of my talk, last 15 minutes perhaps of my talk, is that he, out of this tumultuous situation, which could have been the chaos of a Latin American country in the 1860s, manages to shift and totally transform the map of Europe. And what is clear and what everyone agrees on is the way out of this is a war. What they need to do is to fight a popular war. And ideally, you need to fight a popular war against somebody like you're likely to beat. So how about Denmark, the smallest northern neighbor of Prussia? In 1863, the Danes, who once upon a time, of course, were a mighty empire, had Greenland, Sweden, they were a declining empire, but they still own a large slice of territory, which is majority German. And in 1863, they propose, in their own liberalizing mood, to extend the constitution across all of the Danish territory, which includes Germans, which, however, brings Germans under Danish law. And this is, of course, a red flag to German nationalism. Both Austria and Prussia are happy to declare war on the least opportunity against Denmark because they figure this is somebody they can win against. And in February 1864, the first of the wars of German unification begin. And you'd think that defeating Denmark would be an easy business, but to the embarrassment of the Prussian military, it turns out that that's, that army, which as the Times had said was large but was not ready to fight, genuinely wasn't ready to fight even the Danes. In fact, the Austrian troops do much better. And by April, Bismarck is facing the truly embarrassing situation that other powers, and this is, of course, the nightmare of European politics, you start a war, everyone else tries to mediate immediately. Other powers are swarming over this question, hoping to take advantage of Denmark's weakness and the embarrassment of the Prussians and the Austrians in not being able to finish the war quickly by mediating, which basically means you're the negotiating power which decides the terms of the settlement. And Bismarck, in a typical display of cynicism, says, no, give me one more week. He puts off the, the negotiations, which was supposed to begin on the 18th for literally seven days. And on the 18th of April, tells the Prussian soldiers, it's do or die now. You do everything. You spend as much life as you have to. You use all the material you've got at your equipment. But we need a decisive decision against the Danish army, at least the Danish army, um, in the next 24 hours. And they deliver at huge cost. Uh, to both the Danes and the Prussians in a bloody encounter on the fortifications of Duppel, uh, the Prussians win their first battle since the Napoleonic War. So this is a 50-year hiatus and it has done the Prussian military much good. But it does produce the success that Bismarck is looking for. And with that in hand, he's able to go back to the parliament and say, look, you know, maybe what we're doing is OK. Maybe you'll give us your, our support. But it's perfectly clear that defeating Denmark is no one's idea, really, of the high road to control and hegemony of Central Europe. Ultimately, it's clear to everyone in Prussia that the war that they have to fight, 
is against ha the Habsburgs. They in fact have to fight a German civil war to, con do, to decide how, who will dominate the continent. But it's also clear that you can't do that without the permission or at least agreement and tacit consent of the neighboring powers, because if Prussia defeats the Habsburgs, that shifts the power balance in favor of Berlin. If the Habsburgs defeat the Prussians, it will shift it decisively in favor of Vienna. The French and the Petersburg will be desperately interested whichever way you go. So the first meeting that has to happen to make German unification possible is in fact an alliance between Bismarck and Napoleon III, as you can see here in his non-ceremonial pictures, is a very short man indeed, um, is, is a toleration agreement under which the French agree to allow the Prussians to get on with it, um, provided the Prussians will provide them with compensation if it turns out that um, they uh, defeat the Austrians. And one place in which the French could be compensated would be by further encroachment on what remains of Austrian territory in Italy. And so Prussia then also promptly allies itself with the emerging Italian states to form a triple alliance. Italy and, and Prussia immediately allied, Austria as a side, uh, France as a sidekick in a war against Austria. So the diplomacy is crucial to making this possible. And then between the 14th of June and the 23rd of August, 1866, Prussia embarks on what is literally the German Civil War. We talk, of course, always about the American Civil War. We rarely discuss the German Civil War, but that's what the second war of German unification amounts to. For the first time since the days of Frederick the Great, Prussia, 100 years before, Prussia takes on the Habsburgs directly. It's a very dangerous thing to do. The Habsburg Empire is twice the size of Prussia in terms of population. And the other members of the German Confederation, that's Bavaria, Saxony, Hanover, unsurprisingly ally themselves with the Habsburg Empire against Prussia. In terms of military forces, the Prussian army is hugely outnumbered and has to fight on several different fronts in Saxony, against Hanover, and ultimately against the Habsburgs down here. The one thing they have going for them is that off map down in the south, the Italians launch an attack on the Veneto Mantua, which distracts a large part of the Austrian army. And the French off map in this direction have decided to stand clear. And the Russians off map in this direction are preoccupied with the reform of serfdom and are in any case not going to hasten to the aid of the Austrians after their betrayal in the Crimean War. The real question is, can the Prussian army win against this kind of opposition? Because fighting the Danes, the tiny little country up here, they hadn't done much good. And that is the great shock of the summer of 1866. The Prussian army, in an astonishing inversion of expectations of the last half century up to that point, wins a Napoleonic style, by which I mean giant single battle decisive victory against the Habsburg forces at Königgrätz on the 3rd of June, July 1866. I was, I've been saying this is a German civil war and I mean that comparison seriously. It's about twice the size of the largest battle in the American Civil War, the Fredericksburg encounter of 1862 a half million troops engaged in a single encounter, an absolutely giant battle. And it's won decisively by the Prussians. The question is why? There are many different answers. We could talk about them perhaps in Q&A. A lot of people point to technology uh, armaments. I'm going to single out something else, which is the organization of the Prussian army, which brings into play the third figure in that von, Ver uh, 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 von Werner painting of 1871, this man here, Helmut von Moltke. But from, because from 1857 onwards, what he has begun to do is to shape the Prussian army into the type of decisive military force that is capable of delivering big heavy blows against major enemies and fighting and finishing wars quickly. And if you think about the problem that Bismarck has in trying to escape both his domestic constraints and the international constraints around Prussia, you understand the significance of that, because these wars must not last long. They must not last long and be expensive because they'll undermine domestic support, and they must not last long because otherwise they will tempt the intervention of foreign powers be it Britain, be it Russia, be it France, if you're fighting Austria. And what Moltke gives Bismarck is a surgical tool. 
organized like a modern army and organized around the railway system. Moltke is the first man to build a military system in Germany around the railways. This is the moment when wars fought to railway timetables becomes real. And it is articulated by the new technology of the telegraph, um, which you can see here being strung up by Prussian troops, which enables a small cadre of about 350 officers around Moltke to command an instrument of war. The point I want to make here is this is incredibly new. This didn't exist in 1864 when they attacked Denmark. It suddenly comes into existence in 1866 and transforms the possibilities of power for Bismarck. Because now he faces the ultimate test. He has, with, by humiliating the Habsburgs, not, not just as it were, minorly modified the European balance of power, he has fundamentally transformed it. And the people who understand this best are the French. And above, within the French political scene, the great historian statesman Adolf Thiers, of course, immediately draws the broadest conclusions. And the broadest conclusions from the French point of view is that if there is a dominant power in Germany, a single dominant power in Germany, it reawakens for the French the great fear of encirclement that goes all the way back to the early modern period and the era of Charles V, the great Habsburg Empire that consolidated Habsburg lands from Germany and Austria to Belgium to Spain in a single encircling alliance in the early 1500s around France. Now, this is, of course, largely fantastical. It's a sort of missile gap type argument, but it's hugely compelling and it gives you an idea of how seriously the French take this. And when then, in the summer of 1868, a revolution overthrows the monarchy, a Bourbon monarchy in Spain, and the Spanish liberals go looking for a new king, and who do they hit upon but a distant and Catholic relation of the Hohenzollern who governed Prussia as a possible option? Well, then everyone in France knows that the Charles V encirclement fantasy, the dark vision, is becoming real. And it's that which ultimately triggers the series of diplomatic events that lead to the War of 1870, because this provides Bismarck with the perfect excuse. The French get um, uh, all in a tizzy about the prospect of the German control of Spain, as well as Prussian dominance of Germany. They demand that the House of Hohenzollern um, withdraw the can withdraw the can of the sea of their the member of their family and then in the summer of 1870 they double down and they demand that germ prussia forever renounce any claim to the spanish throne and that from the point of view of bismarck is catnip all you have to do is edit the telegram which the french sent to make it sound more offensive already than it was, and you've got a Kasel Spelli. This is the famous instance of the Emps dispatch. And in July 1870, France and Germany under Prussian control are headed towards war. It's very much a two-sided thing. The French love the idea of teaching the Prussians a lesson. These the scenes in the Place de Bastille in 1870 with the, 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 the slogan ringing to Berlin. And what everyone knows they're talking about is 1806, because the French have been in Berlin and they intend to go back there. And it was the uncle of the present emperor of France who led them there. And that same man will surely take them back to victory. Of course, it turns out to be a total disaster. It turns out to be a total disaster because the French and the Prussian militaries at this point are indifferent. They belong in different moments of history. The French army is an early 19th century army. Von Moltke has crafted a modern force, twice the size of the French army. It doesn't even need to be particularly well led. There's so many Prussian troops that they overwhelm the French, they outmaneuver them, they encircle them. And it leads to the great and humiliating collapse of the French army at Sedan and the surrender of Napoleon III to Bismarck on the 2nd of September, 1870. Game, set and match, you say, the deal is done, France is defeated, a miraculous turn of events compared to where Prussia was 10 years earlier, except no, because we're in modern history now. We're not in a history where an emperor abdicates and the game is over and the deal is done. When the French see their emperor failing and they see their army failing, they don't simply say, right, well, it's time to give up. What they say is it's time for a revolution. It's time to declare a republic. 
And on the 4th of September, two days after Napoleon III's surrender, the French call out a revolutionary levé en masse. They return to their traditions of the 1790s. And all of a sudden, the conservatives, the Prussians, who think of themselves as fighting a short, sharp war to, de to, to decide a question of insults so as to wrap this up and to prevent the Russians, the Austrians, the British, anyone else intervening in this situation, find themselves facing a nation at arms. The French people rising up in defense of a republic. So not only are you now facing a war that's running out of control, but you've also unleashed a revolution. You've replaced a monarchy with a democracy, which is terrifying to the conservatives who are in charge. And the war in France sprawls out from the original neat fighting on the border here and the surrender in, in September into a giant campaign stretched out across all of France and culminating in battles as deep in France as Le Mans and Orléans, all the way down on the border here. And then, of course, the encirclement of Paris. There is a levée en masse in France, the outbreak of guerrilla resistance, the, the legacy of resistance between the French population and the Germans goes back to uh, this moment in 1870-1871. The front tireur being armed by women, the calling out of French guerrillas by Prussian policemen, firing squad executions of French uh, resistant uh, by, by the Prussian army. And Bismarck issuing orders that he wants to see less prisoners taken. Um, in other words, he'd like to see more executions. And at this point, at this point, profound tensions begin to emerge amongst the people who appear only weeks later as in, in that triumphant image of, ja of January uh, 1871. Because Moltke, the supreme military commander, is fighting the wrong kind of war. He's fighting a counterinsurgency war, and Americans today don't need lessons in how bad those are if you're a professional soldier. Bismarck thought he had a tidy little war won against Napoleon III and is now desperately worried about the British, the Austrians and the Russians intervening and overwhelming Prussia at the moment of its triumph. Both of them therefore agree that they need to raise the pressure on the French to somehow end this war as quickly as possible, but they completely disagree about how to do this. Moltke wants to expand the war all over France, defeat the French army wherever it can be found, and then carve up France, end the French problem by dividing it up into slices. Bismarck's solution is, no, fight the French where it hurts most, encircle Paris, and bombard it until the French, out of desperation to save their beautiful capital, surrender to you. That's what's going on in the background of that beautiful scene in the weeks leading up to the declaration of German victory and the unification of Germany. The prospect of besieging Paris, as you can imagine, is grim. It's a huge city, as you all know. It has massive state-of-the-art defensives. The population is mobilized. And frankly, the German soldiers are horrified at the prospect of having to do this. This isn't part of their professional etiquette. Um, the Germans mobilize massive Krupp artillery. Krupp is, of course, incredibly keen on this. The rural manufacturer, he wants to show off how powerful his weapons are. This is the origin of many of the Jules Verne horror stories about oligarchic industrialists. And Bismarck systematically pressures the Prussian king to get his agreement to enable him to use this means of pressuring the French into surrender. General Blumenthal, who is Moltke's man on the scene, who commands Prussian troops around Paris, is furious. He's out of his mind. He can't believe that professional military judgment is being overwritten by the voice of the people and the newspapers being mobilized by people like Bismarck. Bismarck's not a soldier. He dresses up as a soldier, but he's a politician. He's a lawyer. He's never been a soldier in his life. But this is the strategy that Germany ends up pursuing to get to this moment uh, uh, of victory because it is in the wake, as the cannons are booming out on Paris on the 18th, in the early days of, uh, of 1871, that this group is assembled. Um, the Prussian king, who started life out as a profound reactionary, anti-revolutionary, non-nationalist, who now finds himself at the head of a unified state which Bismarck has made, who is waging a, frankly, rule of law breaching siege campaign against the French capital, and Moltke, the professional man, who is fuming, along with many of the other military commanders, at the fact that they're not fighting the war that they would like to fight, which is to crush the French army in the field and do as soldiers do.
Ultimately, the Germans are saved by the fact that the French come to terms. Here, Thiers again slumped in his chair dramatically, accepting the dictation of, of Bismarck. And in the spring, the fateful treaty concludes the Treaty of Frankfurt, which concludes with the massive reparations that the French pay uh, to the Germans and uh, with the fateful division of territory um, between France and Germany. I've spoken for long enough at this point, but I would be remiss if I didn't at least provide you with a brief outlook on some of the issues that spiral out from here. Of course, at one level, Bismarck has now achieved the coup that he was attempting. And you have to understand it as playing every dimension of politics at once. So he's redrawing the map. He's using military power in a new way to achieve new aims with surgical strikes. He's managed the diplomacy such that Britain, France, Russia, Britain, Austria, Russia do not intervene as he humiliates France. And the aim of the game ultimately was to reconstruct German politics. And this brilliant cartoonist depiction is what the Reichstag will look like in future in 1871, a parliament which 10 years ago had been rebellious, was two thirds liberal, will now simply be a parliament full of little Bismarcks. And for the 1870s, this is broadly speaking true, but it doesn't last. Germany becomes by the late 19th century, the great capital of socialism. By 1912, the largest parliament, parliamentary party in the Reichstag is not conservative, it's not little Bismarcks, nor is it anti-Semites. It is socialists, social democrats, radicals, Marxists indeed, who constitute about 32% of the vote. Germany, Bismarck's Germany, this, Bis this Germany which is cartoonishly depicted as full of Bismarck's, is also the home of the largest international women's movement. Germany has the largest feminist movement in, uh, in Europe at the time, indeed in the world at the time. Not for nothing, Germany is also the home of Zionism. The, the language of Zionism before 1914 is, is German, Austrian and, and German. So Germany is not condemned to a future of, of conservatism. It's condemned to, not condemned, but uh, the formation of Germany opens the door to a radical pluralism and modernity of politics. You could say that that causes tension, but it's not really ultimately that which dooms the imperial German system. Um, the imperial Germany was made, as I've argued here, out of a precisely balanced foreign policy, military policy, and domestic political policy. And it is really the undoing of the diplomacy and military policy that dooms Germany ultimately. Bismarck's strategy after unification was profoundly conservative. The idea is to rapidly form a new alliance with Austria and Russia to pacify them, to marginalize the French who are a republic and therefore not really eligible for alliances with dynastic systems like Austria and Russia. Hence the Statue of Liberty in New York. It's a desperate French effort to break out of Bismarck's encirclement and say, look, hey, you other republic on the other side of the Atlantic, we have things in common with you. Hardly any French people in the US after all. It's about political systems. And crucially, Germany refrains from colonial land grabs. In fact, Germany positions itself in the 1880s as the arbiter of other people's land grabs in Africa. And that is the strategy through which Bismarck attempts to make Germany safe. If you're looking for one reason why Germany ultimately suffers the catastrophic 20th century that it does, it's that it's that strategy that's abandoned. It's abandoned with the new Kaiser in the 1890s. You can blame it on him personally, or you could simply say that a state like Germany in the end couldn't stay out of the great power global game. And so he lets Bismarck famously in this punch cartoon, he allows Bismarck to depart the scene in 1890. He then promptly drops the alliance with Russia, which promptly enters into the alliance with France, which Bismarck had predicted in 1857 and is the undoing of Germany in 1914. And the Kaiser promptly embarks on a world power policy which pushes Germany into antagonism with Britain um, and pushes Britain into Entente's unprecedented alliances with Japan, Russia and France, leaving Germany fundamentally isolated in 1914 and its soldiers the descendants of Moltke willing to take the gamble that they did in 1914, that better now than later when things will be even worse. But it cannot be said that Bismarck's partner in power, Helmut von Moltke, the elder, sitting in parliament here in the Reichstag with his conservative party political buddies as the great hero that made Germany, didn't see 
what disaster could transpire. They were under no illusions about how precious, how peculiar, how odd, how exceptional the success they achieved in 1870, well, between Denmark in 1864 and uh, Paris in 1871 was. This is Moltke's speech to the Reichstag in 1890. The age of cabinet war is behind us. All we have now is people's war. Gentlemen of the war that has been hanging over our heads now for more than 10 years, like the sword of Damocles. If this war breaks out, then its duration and its end will be unforeseeable. The greatest powers of Europe, armed as never before, will be going into battle with each other. Not one of them can be crushed so completely in one or two campaigns, as they had done to France and Austria, that it will admit defeat. Be compelled to conclude peace under hard terms and will not come back even if it's a year later, to renew the struggle. Gentlemen, it may be a war of seven years, the nightmare of Frederick the Great, or of 30 years, the nightmare of the 17th century. And woe to him who sets Europe alight, who first puts the fuse to the powder keg. So it wouldn't be fair to say that Bismarck and Moltke didn't understand the risks. They fully did, um, but their successors were not able to control them. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry I went on a little long, but I'd be very happy to take questions. But, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it, it was a great presentation, uh, the, uh, Professor. And it felt that, um, I, I personally felt that I'm in eight, uh, 19th century Europe. Uh, uh, I, I would like to ask everyone if they have any questions, they can enter them in, in the Q&A box. Um, and we would answer them until the uh, eight o'clock ending time. Uh, but, uh, but we have a couple of questions. Uh, an anonymous attendee is asking, uh, how do Marx and Engels uh, view German unification and portend its fate? Uh, you know, so uh, generally question about uh, these philosophers and yeah. uh, their forecast. Marx and Engels are broadly speaking enthusiastic about what's happening. Um, they are, they are, as you would imagine, hugely hostile to Napoleon III. Um, uh, they regard him as corrupt um, and rather excited by what happens. I, I skipped over this because I was running out of time. But of course, amongst the nightmares, the Pandora's box, which they open when they launch this war against France. I mean, their first fear is they're going to lose. Their second fear is that Austria will intervene or Russia will intervene or Britain will intervene. The third fear is the war with France will go on and on and on because the French will do guerrilla like the Spanish did against Napoleon. And the fourth fear, the even worse fear, is you could have a real revolution in France. And that's, of course, exactly what happens in Paris, the city they besiege. You get the commune. And the commune is the real deal. I mean, the commune is what Lenin benchmarks himself against. This is no longer the French Revolution of the 1789. This is the flat out socialist revolution um, of the late 19th and early 20th century. And, you know, of course, the Germans are just recoiling with horror. At that point, they pull their troops out. They want nothing more to do with it. It's a little bit like America's situation in Afghanistan or Iraq. Like you, you open the lid and you end up with ISIS. You know, you, you, you open the lid on France and you end up with communism, the, the real thing. So, you know, unsurprisingly, Marx and Engels are you know, broadly speaking, excited by what's happening here. It's spectacularly dramatic. Um, and to understand later history, it's important to know that people like Georges Clemenceau, he was the deputy for Montmartre in the commune. Like, so the people who 50 years later are trying to put the, the genie back in the box in 1919 are actually veterans, literally on the ground veterans of, of, of that revolutionary struggle. Georges Clemenceau was very fortunate not to have been executed. Uh, during the commune by either side, either by the communards. Marx and Engels in general, as you may know about also their attitude towards imperialism, are not squeamish about violence and have a strong sense of, as it were, the telos of history and where it's going. And they admire the force of Moltke and Bismarck. They admire the scale of which they're able to change history. And all the way back to 1848, 1849, there are a series of very disturbing tracts published by Engels in particular on the necessity of revolutionary war. And the, the revolutionary war has one target and that target is Russia. And the, uh, you can understand why in light of my lecture, right? The policeman, the great gendarme of Europe that holds the lid on conservatism is Russia. Terrible, you know, vengeance wreaked on the Hungarian revolution by Russian troops at the behest of the Habsburgs. And Engels and Marx preach a racial revolutionary war. 
against the Slavic powers as, as a project for liberating the, the Czechs. The first thing the Berlin revolutionary government does in 1848 is contact the French revolutionary government, which has taken power in Paris at the same time, and say, hey, how about doing 1812 again, but properly liberal this time round? So how about launching an invasion eastwards, the first aim of which will be to liberate Poland. And once you've liberated Poland, then you've really got the ball rolling and you can do, uh, you know, dismantle the Russian empire. So that vision of revolutionary transformation by war across national boundaries, aimed ultimately of freeing Europe from the dispensation of conservatism, whether it's Bonapartism in France or Tsarism in the East, is, you know, it's a very ambiguous legacy of, of, of revolutionary politics in that period. Fascinating. Well, well thank you. Uh, well, this may be a related question uh, uh, tangentially. Uh, Peter is asking if the socialists had uh, the largest party in Germany's parliament in 1900, yeah. why didn't they uh, have greater influence in liberalizing Germany? Um, because... Um, because Germany has a complicated political system. Um, um, it has, it's, it's almost like a Jim Crow system. It's like, it's a Jim Crow system um, on the, so it's, it's, it's weird in two ways. It's, it's weird at the national level because the government is not formed out of the parliament. So the, the government is appointed by the Kaiser and the government then goes looking for votes in the parliament. It isn't as though like in the Westminster system or in Germany today, you elect the parliament and then the parliament elects the government. The government is appointed by the Kaiser at his behest and he picks courtiers, civil servants that he likes, generals he appoints as prime minister, as chancellor or as minister of war or foreign affairs. And then they have to, when they want to legislate on the few things for which the Reich legislates, and the Reich is a very thin film. It's like the federal government in the US before the New Deal. It doesn't do very much. It doesn't collect many taxes. It's a, it has foreign policy and military powers and that's all it does. And before you get any you know, excessive ideas, they spend about 2% of GDP on the military, like most states in this period. They're too poor to spend more than that. So the total Reich budget is, budget is maybe three or 4% of GDP. So you're not doing a lot of legislating at the Reich level. But you have a parliament, which is one man, one vote and 80 percent participation and a very effective from the 1890s onwards, very effective socialist mobilization. So you'd say, hang on, this doesn't sound very functional. It's not. It's dysfunctional. Neil Ferguson, my my esteemed uh, colleague from the conservative side of the fence, has the view that the main problem for Germany before 1914 is it was too anti-militarist. In other words, the German military couldn't get enough money voted by a socialist dominant parliament to make themselves feel safe. And because they constantly feared being outraced, arms raced by the Russians and the French, the German military were jumpy. And so they jumped in 1914. If only they'd been able to actually get votes of money from a socialist dominated parliament, they would have felt more secure and they wouldn't have taken the risk. Most of the governing in Germany is done at the state level. A lot of it still is. It's a properly federal state. So education in Germany today is still at the federal level. Policing is still at the federal level. In the imperial system, it was even more so. Prussia is two thirds of imperial Germany and it's entirely uh, self-governing in all crucial respects. And in the Prussian parliament, they have a three tier voting system. It's really like Jim Crow. So working class votes count for one twelfth of the votes of a high taxpayer. And so there are no socialists effectively in the Prussian parliament. So you have a national parliament, which is 33% socialist, 20% Christian Democrat, 12% Polish, 20% liberal, and then 15% conservative and anti-Semite. But at the Prussian level, it's 60% conservative. Right? because of a totally skewed vote. So then you'd say people protest for democracy, don't they? Yes, they do. And given half a chance, you get a revolution like 1918, 1919, which is a genuine revolution in Germany. It's often, it's not a Marxist revolution, so the communists dismiss it, but it's a bourgeois revolution. It creates democracy in Germany. It immediately creates full enfranchisement of everyone, one man, one vote, and women vote as well. So, so there's the are the impediments. It's a, it's a socially progressive, culturally progressive, 
but it's also fissured. People talk about it as a kind of balkanized society. And you, you think about the tradition, if, you know, if you're familiar with Italy in the 50s and 60s, it's a little bit like that with the Italian Communist Party. If you're a communist, if you're a socialist, you live in your own bubble. You go to certain bars, you shop at certain shops, you shop at a co-op, you buy certain sorts of cigarettes, you buy certain newspapers, your kids go to, you know, after school programs in with of your socialist party. You are live in an isolated bubble within that world. It's very progressive indeed. But say in the Prussian army, we think there are two social democratic officers in the entire officer corps, two. <laughs> so, you know, power is massively segmented. It's not a very stable structure and it ultimately is destroyed by a revolution. Okay, thank you. Uh, you may have answered this question, but, but uh, here's the general question, uh, Anonymous. Uh, uh, are there military changes and lessons that uh, occurred uh, as the outcome of German unification that informed the future of European wars, uh, especially World War II, or oh, World War I, sorry. World War I. Um, well, artillery makes a huge leap forward. Um, the Franco-Prussian War, you see um, modern rifles, so breech-loading, um, fast-acting and long-distance rifles. And so, and modern artillery, Krupp's steel cannon are deployed for the first time. Um, and the mitrailleuses, so early machine guns. Um, and the sad thing, in fact, is that more lessons aren't learned. Um, the war was intensely bloody uh, for both sides. The Germans won because the French were incredibly badly led, a similar argument that applies in the Austro-Prussian role as well. Um, and But the, the, in several instances, we see full body massed ranks, Gettysburg style charges um, by both the French and the Germans, and they're totally devastating. Um, massive losses by both sides and, and very few lessons, in fact, effectively learned. The lessons which are, are to do with railway logistics, which everyone takes seriously for the first time after this. Field artillery, which is only one part, however, of what turns out to be crucial in the fighting in World War I, which is largely heavy artillery, and the end of cavalry. So it's quite clear the cavalry remain the prestige regiments in all armies up to 1914. But the ineffectiveness and the sheer lethality of cavalry charges in 1870 really already point to the to the kind of future obsolescence. One of the, the main role for cavalry at this point is in reconnaissance because shot, you know, they were previously a kinetic weapon for delivering a decisive shock charge against massed infantry. The rifle fire basically eliminates that. There are actually one of the main roles for the Ulan, the light cavalry lancers of the German army was chasing French hot air balloons. <laughs> I mean, there are these surreal pictures of, um, of um, because the way in which the French got out of Paris was by hot air balloon and, and detachments of, French, of German lancers would chase the hot air balloons. I mean, which is a sort of, you know, a, a weird sort of, um, steampunk kind of juxtaposition of strange technologies, all of which were kind of on the edge of expiring. Not enough lessons were learned, and that is part of the tragedy of 1914. But, but that the, sounds like a first uh, instance of uh, anti-aircraft... Uh... <laughs> the first instance of anti-aircraft weapons is in the Franco-Prussian War, and it was for shooting down balloons, and Krupp designs a, a light gun um, for Precisely that purpose. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, the, here's a question about uh, what, uh, how should we understand Hitler's interest in, in arts? Uh, uh, or is it connected to Bismarck era? Well, so, so, so um, the important point about Hitler and the story I've just told is that, um, you know, Hitler is not a product of the Bismarckian lineage. Hitler is, as it were, a devastated reaction to the Bismarckian lineage because Hitler's fantasy is option number two, right? So think about it. Klein Deutsch, little German, dominated by Prussia, but not all Germans. Option three, mega Habsburg, a big state full of people who aren't Germans. What Hitler wants is a really big state, but exclusively German. Hitler's nemesis as a German within the... Austrian Empire are the Czechs, 
I mean, these are the people he hates most. They're the dominant Slav group that are coming to get them. And that is a specific trauma of Austria after 1866. So the fact that the large German solution at that point evaporates and that Austria is humiliated and specifically the German bit within Austria is humiliated because what Aust the Germans within Austria immediately have to do in 1866 is negotiate a deal with the Hungarians. So you then suddenly find yourself as a passionate patriotic German cut adrift because A, you're sharing power with the Hungarians who are themselves like a nationalist, imperialist, Magyar group and coming up from the side are the Slavs who outnumber you. And this is where the, the real paranoia of Hitlerine nationalism comes from, is that you are a stranded minority bereft of an attachment to the mothership which you thought you were going to belong to. And this is the environment in which anti-Semitism then becomes rife. And it's not by coincidence that, that Hitler finally finds his fulfillment in Munich, in that amazing scene that we have of you know, Hitler in the crowd in the Kronprinzenplatz in, in, in Munich, and he joins the German army, not the Austrian army. He fights in he fights in the he fights in the German army. And, and if you read Mein Kampf, he describes the convulsive. It's the entire iconography that I've taken you through in today's lecture, all the way back to 1813. Now realized as an Austrian in the in the bosom of a, a Germany, right, which is going to be unified, still not unified. Yeah. So he he comes out of that. He's artistic. I mean. He is a, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a not a bad, you know, by the standards of, he's a better watercolorist than I am. He's not a bad, you know, he's not a bad artist. What's really striking about him is his, his historical interest, to my mind. I mean, he is passionately interested in history. And this is one of the connecting rods to the story, how this ends, right? One of the things that's striking about Bismarck is ultimately, he's a calculator, he, he is not, he, he thinks of history as something you navigate within, but that you maintain your capacity to navigate, right? You don't just succumb to history. You're positioning yourself, he famously says, in the current of history and manipulating it. And, and you play for the stakes that are available. They may be high, but you play for the stakes that are available. The generation that comes after, the younger Moltke, the people that come after Bismarck are... Hannah Arendt will describe this almost like possessed by history. They don't feel they have any options at all. You have to do things because history dictates that you have to do things. Obviously, Marxists of a certain sort are very, very prone to this kind of thinking. And Hitler and indeed the decision makers in Germany in 1914 are very tied up with this. They, they say things like, since a racial war with Slavdom, this is what they say in 1914, is bound to come bound to come. History, in other words, dictates it. We must do X or Y in this particular instance, start a war immediately. Here, Bismarck will be saying, okay, like if I see an antagonism with the Russians, what could I do to kind of modulate that antagonism? They go the other way around. The antagonism is inevitable because it's determined by race biology or something. So therefore, what do we have to do? And Hitler is completely characteristic of this type. In his particular case, it's not Marxist determinism, it's racial determinism. He thinks the, you know, the war between the Germans and the Jewish race is inevitable, whatever you do, you can't escape it. If you think you're escaping it, you're just kidding yourself. So the only way to really handle it is to throw yourself into it. And, and that, that's a very characteristic move, I think, of late 19th century, early 20th century politics, which he shares with, with many other people of his generation. Okay. Well, but maybe a related question. Uh, would, would it have mattered if uh, after defeat of uh, Habsburg by under the hands of Prussians, uh, they would have taken over uh, Bohemia, which I think Hitler was from? Is that... Um, uh, they have done the this? Germans had taken it. Yeah, Bismarck, this is, this is typical Bismarck. So Bismarck totally resisted that logic because, you know, I mean... I mean, it's a huge problem. Why would you take Why would you take Bohemia if you're planning to have one man, one vote, right? So, so um, Germany before 1914 is a little bit like Britain before 1914. The Poles, who are fully enfranchised, you know, they they don't they're not allowed to speak Polish in school. 
school, so they're discriminated against systematically, but that doesn't prevent them from organizing political parties which are in the Reichstag. They have to swing vote. Like, so uh, you, if you enfranchise minorities within multi-ethnic states, you're in incredible trouble. And the British discovered this in Ireland before 1914. The Irish had the swing vote in the British Parliament before 1914. And so taking Bohemia in is, a, is just a recipe for disasters. You're basically adding more Czech votes to ethnic minorities in the Reichstag. No, no German nationalist would want to do that. Hitler, of course, solves that kind of problem by saying, I will get rid of the people or I will reduce them to the state of helots or something like that. But no self-respecting 19th century German imperialist thinks like that. They want the land with the people. And then if you're going to kind of grant rights, you're going to have to grant rights to them in the same way. Sure, there is going to be persecution and discrimination of various types, but you're not going to engage in, in the territory of Europe in wholesale exclusion. It's only in the middle of World War I that we begin to see thinking like that. So when the Germans talk about annexing bits of Poland, they start talking about expelling all the Poles. This is very new thinking. And, and, and Hitler, of course, takes that to the next level. So no, Bismarck looks at Bohemia and says, you know, you know not with a, don't, I won't touch it with a barge pole, leave that to the Austrians and, and the Austrians will, will die, you know, it will, will poison the Austrian political situation marvelously. So no, we, we, the, the German territorial demands on Austria were, were absolutely minimal. He won't even let, the Prussian military have the thing that they crave most of all, which is to emulate Napoleon's triumphant entry to Vienna. That's what the, the Prussian military want to do, what Napoleon did after, after Ulm, and take the keys of Vienna in surrender. You know, because doing that's a big deal. The Ottomans failed to do it. Like capturing Vienna is, is top draw military triumph. And after Königgrätz, the Prussian military desperately wanted to do that. And Bismarck says, there's no way we're doing that because we won't then be able to make peace with them. So he has that calculating logic, which is, 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 is self-restraining. Okay, Paul, uh, here's one last question. It's a little uh, uh, away from our uh, topic, but here's a question from Peter. Any lessons from Germany's 20th century history that, would, uh, that the world should apply to China today? Well, Germany thinks there are lessons from its 20th century history for China today. And, and, and as we know, they're, they're rather different from the lessons that America thinks that it should apply to China today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Angela Merkel's vision of, of detente with China is clearly in, profoundly shaped by her experience. Um, she is, after all, somebody who matured. She was in her mid 30s before the wall came down. She's a product of the communist society. She's fluent in Russian. She's fluent in Marxism. She understands what official Marxisms are like. Um, she understands the flexibility of dealing with them. She also has a world historic sense of the scale of China and its significance and the fact that sort of applying Western standards to it may just be hubristic and a misunderstanding of relative 1.4 billion against the rest of us. China's several thousand years of civilization against whatever we've got. Like, she has a sort of sense of, you know, modest modesty and scale. She, of course, does not wield the superpower instruments of the United States. Germany, thanks to the destruction of the German Empire in China, um, was one of the Weimar Republic was the first Western state to recognize the Chinese Republic in the 1920s entirely without conditions. So everyone else insisted on the separate extrajudicial status for, so if you were French or British or Japanese or American and in China, Chinese law didn't apply to you. The Weimar Republic, because it has no empire left in China, of course they had Shandong, but they lost it to the Japanese, simply says, right, well, this is a great opportunity. We can approach China on the basis of absolute equality and, and, and agree to recognize the Chinese Republic. So Chiang Kai-shek's military are trained by German officers, the Chinese Nationalist Army. If you've seen pictures of them fighting the Japanese in Nanjing, it, they look like Wehrmacht soldiers because they're wearing German helmets. Germany and China have been involved in a relationship of, you know, relative, not equality, but as it were, outside the domain of hegemonic imperial demands for longer than anyone else in the West. And I think that that's significant. Um, so, 
So yes, the Germans are drawing those kind of lessons. Whether America chooses to appropriate those lessons, America is a very different state. You know, I mean, Germany is sovereign now, but it chooses to subordinate by law its sovereignty, its full military sovereignty to global institutions. A German president had to resign because on a trip to Afghanistan in the jet lagged flight home, he'd been visiting German soldiers in Afghanistan and we know how useful they were. And so he was trying to raise morale and they'd been protected by the Americans and they were having a hard time. And on the way back, he said to German journalists, you know, the German public really ought to appreciate the role, the job that our boys are doing, our troops are doing out there. You know, they're there in part for our interest. We have an interest in being there. By the time he had arrived back in Germany, it was clear he was going to have to resign. Because Germany's military cannot be deployed in the pursuit of national interest. Oh. Full stop. It's against the German constitution. <laughs> I mean, just imagine that from an American point of view. <laughs> That's a fundamentally different conception of sovereignty. Um, it, is, it is systematically by, by constitutional in the most foundational elements of the German basic law subordinate its use of force to universal standards. It can be deployed only in the context of a NATO deployment or a UN uh, Security Council agreement, and it cannot be for the pursuit of German national interest. You know, that's, and that is a direct lesson of the history that, you know, that I started sketching for you here, because one of the things that made Germany different was that the control, the political control of the German military fails. It fails in 1914, it fails in 1939. And that is the central core lesson that the, the West Germans and then the Federal Republic have learned, which is that the political control of military power has to be very tight. It has to be subordinate to laws which and rules and norms that go beyond the nation state. And they are deadly serious about that. I mean, literally, the president had to resign for those comments made on an airplane on the way back from Afghanistan. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. We, we actually, uh, we are over time. I just want to mention that we, we have recorded this, uh, this uh, uh, pr uh, uh, presentation and uh, we will share with you uh, through an email uh, so, so people can rewatch it. Uh, any, any final remarks, uh, Professor? Oh, it was a real pleasure talking to you all. Well, then I'm very glad that you chose this event as, a, as an event in your series, because it's a, it is indeed, it's a highly significant historical event. And what's been striking in Germany as well is there hasn't been much about it. <laughs> oh, really? COVID, but like, you know, there hasn't been a great deal of commemorative brouhaha about, about this moment. And, and it's, 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 I'm, I'm delighted that you, you chose, to, chose it as one of your topics. Okay. Well, thank you. And uh, I hopefully see you soon. Yes. Bye-bye.